So, what then of Zacharias, the humble farmer turned lich turned archmage, the scourge of Talengard, and one of the most dangerous beings on Galarion? Well, after the disappearance of Talengard and the scattering of the Whispering Lords, there really wasn't too many people around to witness what became of Zacharias Wraith also known as the Archwizard and the Ever-Living. Scattered witnesses from surviving Utak did report back that a dread creature of malice and death, matching the description, was seen walking out into the roiling seas of the north. With him marched a small army of undead and wraiths, seemingly going down into the bowels of the sea and perhaps beyond. The tyrant had promised Zacharias much, and showed him more. <clears throat> the next step in Zacharias's ultimate plans was located below the earth, deeper than anyone could fathom, far below the realms of Drow, Dwergar, and even the Aboleths. In the alien darkness where only the dead dared thread lay his prize. And he was going to claim it, and his destiny. The gods can die. It is just a matter of how. So what better way to find out how than to plunder one of their tombs? The nameless tyrant would show the way. <coughs> Two months before the disappearance of Talengard. <coughs> now, excuse me. The letter with the offer came suddenly, and with no prior warning or preamble. Matthias would often, in the many years after, think back on it as a sign of providence, even though he would never voice that particular thought to anyone. <coughs> the um, letter was from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Absalom, and the offered position was such that Young Matthias had to read the letter several times and consult his mentor and professor Tiberius Thrain to fully grasp its scope and importance. A new department was to open up, and heading up this department was to be a newly instated and fully funded professorship. The old prefect of the academy had, along with the philanthropist's generous donations, gotten a special recommendation to consider young Matthias. In short, the chance seemed almost too good to be true, but the seal was real, and the signature was real as well. Professor Thrain confirmed this himself. And on his urgings, Matthias took the chance. He was tired of Talengard after, after all. Nothing seemed to be what it used to be, with the war, the dragons, and the Asmodian cultists everywhere. Perhaps going away for a few years would be a good idea. And so, Matthias Daverson, although he had up, th up uh, to this point never known his real last name, sailed to Absalom. The first year was hectic, as one would expect from such a newly established academic position, but the funding turned out to be solid, and Professor Matthias's department grew, and soon he became respected in his own right. Then another letter arrived. Apparently some old and distant relative had died, and his last will and testament was that his holdings was to go to Matthias. With this sudden revelation, Matthias also came to learn his true last name, Daverson. The uh, estate certainly looked old, but it was well appointed, and so Matthias Daverson moved in. Shortly after, he met the woman who was to be his beloved wife, and soon after, their first child was born. In the following years, the Davery family prospered in Absalom. The old estate was not without its mysteries, however. One of them was that... Every year, a peculiar chest would appear in the basement, filled with gold and jewels, managing always to keep the family affluent and wanting for nothing. <coughs> Although misfortune certainly struck the family along the many decades, um, the, these disasters never truly was as large-scale or as calamitous as they could have been almost as if someone or something kept an eye on the family, warding off or scaring off whatever opponents the family might have had. A guardian angel, as it were. Though that would have been a very ironic uh, thought 
had it ever come to the angel's attention. There was, however, the family curse. The disappearances. In every decade or so, uh, as the family expanded and grew, one of the young and brilliant children would disappear without a trace. This was usually after them telling of strange experiences and some form of visions and visitations. They began hearing whispers, and sometimes saw in their dreams a figure cloaked in shadow, speaking to them and urging them to search and to find something, or some place. This led them to explore the many tunnels and catacombs and ruins in, around and beneath the old estate, plumbing ever deeper for something they never quite knew what it was. Many of the children that went on this hunt either turned up dead, or not at all, disappearing into the gloomy depths under the old house. The family began to call these visions and urgings for the whispers of the wraith. Many attempts were made to lift the curse, but none seemingly succeeded. Nevertheless, the family line lives on and prospers. And isn't that what is most important, after all? From the <coughs> Scattered and Burned Journal of Investigator Morgan Tchall, found in the ruins of the Palace of the Grand Elect in Almas and Doran, one week after the palace's sudden and violent destruction. I first started to notice these patterns decades ago. A strange change of weather, the air is growing colder, or the sun losing some of its luster, as if an unseeable but thick cloud would slowly move in over the area. First the disappearances were shocked up to accidents or fits of lunacy. Heavens know that the affected all usually had had rumors to be eccentrics or loners. What they all had in common, however, was also that they were experts in their different fields. Some of the most learned men and women <coughs> on the continent, as I later discovered. I also soon learned that this <coughs> cloud, this darkness, had not just been over my own hometown, but had been felt all over the world, as it would seem. But as far as I know, my aunt Martha Doris, professor of the planar research of the Rotterdam Grand Academy, was one of the first to vanish in this way. She began to withdraw <coughs> from the family, telling us that she was on the verge of an amazing discovery, that it could change the world. She was becoming ever more frayed and worn, however, and with every meeting we urged her to stop the research or at least take a break or sleep, but she was bent on finishing it as quickly as she could. Then the shadow came over the city, as I described, and she vanished. Not much was left in her private study, only scattered notes and dead plants. Her entire library was gone with her, and I have searched for her ever since. I became obsessed with finding her, and I tried to retrace her steps in the academy, to see what books she had consulted and what experts she had talked to. But it was largely in vain. The best I got was something to do with cosmic effects of divine imbalance or some such. Dangerous research in Rohadum, to say the least. But I began my investigations uh, in earnest and managed to learn that as I described above, the strange weather had been observed all over the Inner Sea region. Always it would appear suddenly, birds growing quiet, cattle becoming restless with fear or anticipation, or perhaps both. Old soothsayers would begin to babble, and so on. Then it would pass as suddenly as it appeared, and with it passing, someone would have gone missing, or some vault was discovered being plundered. No survivors, no witnesses, usually. In Taldor, I found a house guard of a vanished noble who claimed to have seen something. Tracking him down to the local asylum was <clears throat> not the easiest of tasks. With war raging in Taldor and the 
many conflicts and, and horrors that was visited upon the land, it was a challenge to track uh, the guard down. But not as much of a challenge to, uh, as it turned out to understand his mad ravings. But between the ministrations of the healers and his insane fits, he seemingly had moments of clarity. During these, he claimed that uh, he had heard a disturbance from his master's study, and rushed in to see what was wrong, only to discover what he swears was a tear in reality itself. And before it stood his master, staring into it as if transfixed. The guard only caught the slightest of glimpses of the rift itself, but what he saw apparently broke him. An endless void and a terrible stormy sea jutting out from the ravaged ocean of darkness was a spire of enormous proportions, and with souls of the damned caught as if by the storm swirling around it. The screams tearing at his very soul, beckoning him to take the leap and join them forever. But the real terror was the figure that stood in the rift's opening, a visage of such otherworldly horror that God refused to recall it even as I pressed him for the details. He only said that it was a living, or rather dead, personification of malice and purest annihilation, with an aura of such power that reality seemed to groan at its very presence. It beckoned his master to enter the rift, which the master did, staggering. Then the rift closed, and nothing but cracks in the wall, ceiling and floor of the room told of what had happened there. At this point of the recounting, the god fell into a catatonic state, and I had to leave at the insistent urgings of the healers. Later that night, I found out that the god had seemingly died as a result of the psychic trauma. I have followed this shadow from the void for decades now, and I am so very close. If my predictions are right, he will strike tonight at the ostentatious estate of the Grand Elect here in Alvas. I have warned the Grand Elect, and there has been precautions made. When this Wraith of the Void makes its entrance, we shall be ready for it, and we shall beat it. Soon, my dear Aunt Martha, soon I shall know what became of you. I am so close now. The rest of the journal is too burnt, or damaged by the explosion, to read. As the centuries went by, the island of Tellingard passed from memory and into legend, as a lost paradise or a cursed land, depending on who told the tale. Only a few scattered islets remained where the fabled land supposedly once lay, its location often visited by daring captains and adventurers. But few actually believed the old stories of the grand battle between the forces of good and evil, but then again that didn't really matter. It was a good story, and good stories have a tendency to live on, embellished upon with each telling, and always drawing a select few enterprising parties to investigate. Because, as we all know, where there is legend, there might be treasure. And so, there were a few direct witnesses when the catastrophe happened. In the year of 5371 Absalom Reckoning, the skies were suddenly rendered asunder, and the awestruck few people that were there saw three huge comets, like falling stars of dying and blackening, but once pure light comes screaming down from the heavens and crashing into the sea. In that split second, when the skies cracked, the people saw a burning golden city, a darkness that defies description assailing it, and in their minds a triumphant laughter of such dread power they could not bear it. As the comets streaked down towards the watery grave, clerics, oracles, and soothsayers all over the world began screaming and gibbering, clawing at their eyes and ears, some biting their tongues off and drowning in their own blood, while others broke their own backs into convulsions. Exactly what they saw they never could tell. Some survived the event with no recollection of it, some refused to speak of it, and many more went insane, screaming about a laughing face of death with baleful blazing blue eyes. One thing is certain, however. Something truly horrifying had happened. Not since Arodine had such repercussions 
been felt in the realm of the divine. A god had been murdered. And in the minds of the witnesses and the holy people was left but a whisper. The ever-living triumphant.